Welcome to our podcast, Deep Dive, MTR Explores Subsea Technology. I'm your host, Rhonda Meniz, and this is your portal to the latest news on all things subsea technology. This episode is brought to you by the publishers of Marine Technology Reporter, the world's largest circulation publication serving the global scientific, defense, and offshore energy subsea market. For more information, visit marinetechnologynews.com. Well, welcome everyone to this episode of Deep Dive. I am, um, I've really been looking forward to this conversation today um, with Will Conan and um, it, I'm, I'm really excited about it. I've been waiting to chat with him. And uh, so uh, Will, and I'm going to give you a little bit more information, but Will Conan, many people know, and he's very involved in the submersible, manned submersible industry. And um, I've always been fascinated with the manned submersible industry. I come from a diving ROV, AUV background, doing a lot of work in working with some large um, ROVs that are rated, you know, 6,000 meter, 4,000 meter systems and um, have been really um, involved in that for many years. And but I've always had this fascination with manned submersibles. So I'm really excited to have Will on, um, on Deep Dive today. And Will is the president and CEO of uh, Hydrospace Group. He's also, he wears a lot of hats. He's also the chairman of the board for the MTS uh, Submersible Committee. That's Marine Technology Society's Submersible Co Committee. And then he's also the chair of the board for the World Submersible Organization. Did I get all that right, Will? Because you're, you got a lot going on here. So that's all, that's uh, a, a bunch of different hats that you wear. So I thought maybe you could start by talking a little bit about some of this and maybe giving us your background and welcome, welcome to Deep Dive. Super excited to have you here. Thanks for taking the time to be on the show. Well, hi, Rhonda. Yeah, it's uh, uh, the pleasure is uh, mutual here. Uh, there are so many stories to tell, and uh, thanks for the intro. Uh, yeah, for uh, just for the audience, the word submersible and submarine is often asked, well, what's the difference between the two? And uh, the uh, uh, usually the submersible uh, does day trips and comes back to surface every day. A submarine goes for multiple days. But for first graders, I usually tell them, well, it's easy to remember. A, a submarine has a toilet. And then other <laughs> kids kind of remember. Uh, so the... Uh, in kids the, like that in stuff. The here, yeah. So uh, in our conversations, you're going to hear me use the word submarine uh, because the word submersible, as you know, the ROVs, AUVs, they're all submersible vehicles. And then you have to add a pre-qualifier if it's manned and unmanned, and you shouldn't say manned. So uh, instead of crude and uncrewed, uh, we just decided, look, we're just going to use the word submarine because everybody pictures that a submarine is has people in it. That works for me. I think that's a good time. idea. <laughs> so you always get somebody upset. I suspect we might get the Navy upset saying that's not a submarine, but I mean, we'll just go with that. All right. Uh, it it, it, it kind of creates it. So if I use the word submarine, uh, I usually mean an underwater vehicle that has humans inside of uh, of all types. So uh, it, it it's a, it's a simple word to use. And that's why with the Marine Technology Society, it was the manned undersea vehicles and right now, uh, we're just calling it the Submarine Committee. And uh, also for uh, the World Submarine Organization, uh, uh, here the word submarine uh, basically refers to all civilian applications of underwater vehicles. So just to, to, to frame that, because it's recurring and people might have questions. Right. That makes sense. So how did you get into this whole world? Where did this start? I mean, who, how do you get into that? That It's just amazing. Well, I, I still think God has a sense of humor. I mean, how do you get a, 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 a kid that milked cows until he was 20 years old uh, to be uh, into the submarine industry? I mean, I didn't see the ocean until I was 25 years old. Wow. Yeah, I mean, I so I, I was born in Germany. My uh, uh, born on a milk farm. Uh, my dad immigrated to uh, Quebec in 1965, and uh, uh, we we learned French. Uh, uh, so English is the third language. It, it took me uh, 
more than high school to learn English. Uh, I figured it out afterwards. Um, and uh, went to McGill University, did an electrical engineering degree and moved to California in 86 because someone said the roads were paved with gold over here. So I'm still digging. <laughs> But yeah, in the ocean, uh, I started in aerospace, uh, doing just amazing stuff over here, uh, and uh, but with a greater aspiration of changing the world and you know what do we need. Actually, my first idea was to make a spacecraft, you know, a personal spacecraft. I mean, why not? You you know, dream big, you know, or go home. Uh, but I figured, you know, the launching systems, they're really expensive. I mean, it's it's you don't get. You don't get the shortcut on the launching system. But uh, like I said, I was maybe, I was 25 years old. My friend got married in Mexico and he said, hey, do you want to come over Christmas holiday? Uh, and I did. It, apparently they still remember the songs I sang. I don't remember them, but we had a lot of fun. And uh, we did a detour to Acapulco and my buddy said, hey, try this snorkel mask on. He was from the Azores. He, he knew about those. And I was just blown away. I, 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 it just looked like a gray surface. And here it was, uh, looking back, it was fairly modest what I saw, but it just blew my mind. And, uh, and what I remember most is that after about an hour, uh, uh, we both signaled each other, hey, let's go back up, uh, because I seriously thought I was underwater, to realize it was only my head in the water, and I just lifted it up. And I realized this whole time I was just an inch below the surface. It's like, oh my God, this is really weird. It's like this entire universe, it could have been Mars or Jupiter, but this was what I call hydrospace. I'd ne never seen it. And it doesn't start 10,000 feet away. It's, it's just an inch away. So I, today I call it the uh, Narnia barrier. You, know? mm -hmm. you just have to cross the Narnia barrier. And everybody who dives kind of knows just the fantastic transition you do. Right? And so that occurred to me years later when I was in aerospace, it's like, hey, that spaceship, you know, we could just, instead of launching it into space, let's launch it into the water. There's another hydrospace there. We And just come up with a simple vehicle to bring people below that, that barrier and discover the ocean. And uh, that's how uh, uh, I came up with a new type of little fancy submarine and uh, started Seamagine Hydrospace with my brother and some partners in 1995. I mean, at the point, at 1995, oh my gosh, people thought submarines, they're going to go the way of the dodo, you know? Right. We are A lot of people later. thought that, I think. They did. They did. And, uh, but we had, we had a vision and, and, and it is a vision of, you know, the imagination and the, the need of if anything, is the application of human talent to an application. And, I mean, it comes to the fore on the farm, right? I mean, we, so we're a big family. We're eight kids, you know, everybody gets their chores and stuff. And, and you find out pretty good, pretty fast uh, who's good at what, right? And it, it's not all the same. And, and so I keep saying when people are, are programming AUVs and stuff uh, for all the, artificial intelligence it's like hey when you're when you're coding the the subroutine that's called the talent um, <laughs> i really got to get interested into that see see how you how you're putting that in there uh, it is a magic it it does magic and it ties to imagination and uh, i think it is uh, i profoundly think that in my lifetime if we do it right we can change uh, uh, humans have agency in their environment and i think it's a if there is anything uh, in the course of the conversation here is it comes back to making sure young people understand that we're not uh, helpless uh, in the face of the environmental changes, that humans have agency and the agency comes through their talent and their imagination. And, you know, the submarines is just another, it's just another tool in your quiver of, of how we, how we do things. And, and so the you pillar, can... the pillar I use is agriculture to 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 use as an example. So you um, you and your brother started the hydrospace group. That was Seamagine Hydrospace. Seamagine Hydrospace, and um, and it was with the intention to start working with um, subs, mm -hmm. and to start developing subs and and um, and and what happened? So what happened after that? 
well, it, you know, it, with uh, full enthusiasm and optimism, uh, uh, you know, you figure build them and they will come, right? <laughs> uh, so it's it's taken some time. Uh, it's taken some time. We're at the leading edge today. Uh, we're 30 years later. And uh, the industry is still trying to figure out, so where 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 is the, is there a boom? Which way is it going? Uh, uh it it has it has many many uh, uh, directions. Right now, the biggest direction is uh, private use. Uh, so mm-hmm. a lot of people put them on their yachts, and and uh, citizen science is a big thing on the planet today, uh, both for philanthropy and and, and and private applications. But it goes a little further. My vision was always back in 1993. I I, I reasoned it this way. I said, okay, look, the aerospace industry gets split into like not just sectors, but entire segments of industry, because you have uh, private aviation, general aviation, commercial aviation, military aviation. I mean, these are big segments, right? And you say, well, what do we have in hydrospace as opposed to aerospace? Well, we got military hydrospace. Well, where's private hydrospace? Where's general hydrospace? Where's uh, commercial hydrospace? I mean, where are, is the answer that it's zero? Like it cannot be, you know, it just cannot be. So that the the it is it is it is still up for grabs, and and that's what should lead young people to think, oh my gosh, you know, there's maybe 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 we go through that door and find out there's a big room behind that door, and there's things we can do. Um, and in vehicles, just like on land, uh, you know, there's a difference between a, a, a John Deere tractor and a Ferrari, right, and a UPS truck, right. It's like, well, they all have four wheels and they have an engine, but the purposes are very different. Uh, and I think there is a, 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 a limitless variety of things we need uh, underwater to mainly understand what the it, it is about understanding our environment and doing something about it. And, uh, you know, people say, well, you know, it would take uh, 100,000 divers to dive every day to clean everything up. And so it's not possible and we're stuck or just there's no government funding for it. And it's like, yeah, well, I don't think that's the general idea. It, it is about the future, it is about productivity, and everybody talks productivity. It's not about paying people less. It's about do, getting more done. And that's where, like I mentioned, the, the milestone I take is agriculture because I we're from 10 generations of farming, German farmers, right? So the, the, the concept of stewardship of land and in taking care of producing food to maintain uh, life uh, is is really serious. And, and it is, okay, how do you go about that? Uh, and uh, uh, the uh, the productivity change in the last, like in my lifetime, right? I mean, it's, I remember my dad in Germany uh, 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 sharpening his scythe with right. the rock because he was going, I mean, we had six cows and he was going to cut grass, right? And, uh, and, and I did a lot of hay cutting in my time and you're on the field and you're cutting acres and acres. And, uh, 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 my dad would always tell us stories and it's like, yeah, you know, this is, is five mornings area. It's like, dad, what the heck is with your weird units? You know, how about like modern units? What the heck is a morning? <laughs> says, no, no, no. In the time, medieval time, you know, morning is there's five mornings to a, 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 a hectare instead of four acres. It's like, well, come on, Dad. I mean, seriously? It's like, no, no, that's what uh, one a solid farmer can cut in a morning. That's a unit of measure. It's like, okay, well, there goes a measure. But you figure over uh, hundreds of years, right? Uh, today, uh, I look in California and I drive by and I see these massive alfalfa fields where they have these combines and just running up and down a couple kilometers uh, up and down. And I mean, they will cut, they will cut like a thousand mornings, you know, in a day. Right. right. I mean, they've got recognition, they've got the cabin, the guy's not a complete idiot. I mean, he knows how to run the machine. You've got to be talented to use it. And it's like, okay, that simple element in the space of, I call it 50, 60 years, right? The, uh, you're saying that's not a 10% or 20% change or 100% change. That's like a thousand fold. Right. right, it's three orders of magnitude, and and what's a common thing? Both people are working their butt off. Right, right. it is not about 
just working less. You just got to work. You wake up in the morning, you got to work, right? It's just how much do you get done? And so, and it's not robotics and stuff. It's the human leverage of mechanization. And I mean, you look at the agricultural equipment they make today. I mean, it is a wonder what people produce and all the apples, potatoes and whatever you mean, right? And, and it is about productivity. It is not about reducing how hard you work. You just got to work like crazy, but you get more done. And I think I, I, I see a lot of parallels there that the agency we have in the ocean is tied to not uh, telling Google, please go fix something. It is about someone going out there, doing the hard work, but you are leveraged. And I think machines come into this. And I think the uh, submarines of many, many types. And again, like, what do they look like? Well, it's completely up to your imagination. What does a bulldozer look like underwater, right? What does a harvester look like? Um, a cleanup machine. So uh, someone mentioned, that, yeah, well, it's really important people go down there and, 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 and see uh, what there is out there. And I said, no, 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 they have to to see what they need to do. Right. 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 There is work to be done. Right. And, 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 and you got to remove the obstacle. And right now, one of the biggest obstacles for sure is access. And, and the ocean is a big place. I mean, you, you know, but just like farming, you don't have to plant corn on the top of Mount Everest. Right. It's like, but you plant corn in arable land. It's the same thing with our shoreline. So we have our literal areas or economic zones. You know, if you go down to the first thousand feet, if you get that clean and you get that sorted out, okay, you're ahead of the game, right? Right. So the uh, so the it, it is about human agency to do something about the oceans, and it is about productivity. And you know, we've cleaned enough barns full of poop, and you know, if you say, okay, clean that up with a spoon, you'd say, okay, it's not possible. It's like take the tractor, okay, that's a morning. Um, it is it is knowing that there is a way to get there uh, uh, between spoon and tractor. And, uh, uh, you know, if you only think you have a spoon, you just give up and you say you won't even start trying. And, and that's kind of the endeavor in pushing the submarine industry, if you want, with a with a global view of, of all and any types. Uh, and and that's why the MTS Submarine Committee, it's really the chairmanship of stewarding the entire group, the entire family to say, come on, let's be creative. Let's do this. Let's pay attention. There's lots of room for innovation. And it's exciting. I mean, you know, you, you take a little submarine on the courtyard and you've got kids around. I mean, they'll be crawling over that thing like that. It, it is absolutely fascinating. In 30 years, it it, it is never fails. You, you bring a submarine in a, in a yard and there are kids around. I mean, they just go nuts, right? And, and it is a power of triggering imagination. And, and that has to, that must stand. In a hundred years, the ability of humans to use their imagination to solve a problem, I mean, it, it, it must be a pillar of our agency and of our survival, right? And it's interesting because you talked a little bit about, um, we've talked about ROVs and, and AUVs. There has been over the years this sort of, um, some people believe that that's the direction that everything is taking and that crude submersibles or subs submarines, as we're talking, using that term today, um, are kind of, you know, something of a thing of the past. And, and what do you say when people say something like that? Because the, the thought that I have is when I've talked, I've been on a, a sub and we can talk about that in a little bit, but cause I'm going to, start talking a little bit about some other things with regard to um, recent things that have gone on in that uh, area. But um, it, it, I will say that I agree with, in having worked with ROVs and AUVs and having been in a small sub, um, there is a difference between being there and looking out that window and looking out and seeing things and actually being there as opposed to driving a vehicle to that location there is a difference it's a it's in in to me uh, it's why i think i have a, a an affinity for the submersibles or the subs that i think that it it there's a, they offer a lot 
And I don't think they're going to go by the wayside, or at least I hope they don't. Yeah, no, they, I mean, they, 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 you know, we just had our 20th anniversary at our uh, uh, annual submarine symposium. And I started that in, two, in 2003. I mean, look, I was born in 59. Uh, uh, the year 2000 was something magic. I mean, any 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 blue-blooded kid who think, thought about the future, year 2000 was a big deal, you know? I mean, geez, now we're hiring now we're hiring kids that were born after 2000. It's kind of really weird. Right. Um, but, you know, in the year 2000, um, uh, in 03, I, I took over the chairmanship of the uh, MTS Submarine Committee. And it's like, wait a minute, I, I come from aerospace. We have international conferences and we've got technical things going on all the time. And it's like, where? why isn't there a submarine conference anywhere? And like, we, we need to at least sit one place once a year, one time, everybody together uh, 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 to discuss the issues of, of submarines. And um, so we just celebrated our 20th anniversary. We had a, a lot of response. We had over 200 people we from 16 countries. And the response was uh, was really strong. Um, I think uh, I think there's, it, it supports the idea that they're not about to go the way of the dodo. But Look, it's just another tool in a big arsenal of, of equipment we need, right? And and it is about specialization. Um, uh, if you are, if you need to travel any sort of distance, uh, it gets uh, pretty tricky uh, uh, with an ROV. But they're absolutely irreplaceable uh, if you have a work site and you need to work for one month, twenty four seven on one work site. I mean, hands down, no question. Uh, same with uh, AUVs. I think the world kind of forgets. Uh, I was just reading a book about uh, uh, the story of Magellan going around the world uh, the first time. And my God, what a crazy, crazy story, right? I mean, <laughs> we, we, it, it's quick uh, uh, with the, the internet thought of you, you look at Google Maps and you go around the world with your fingers as you rotate it, just how big the ocean is. I mean, the fact that the humans even have the ability to impact uh, what happens in the ocean is, is hard to believe. It is a very large place. So uh, uh, to explore the expanse of the ocean seafloor, uh, it takes more than submarines. Uh, it takes like uh, option E, all of the above, everything. In. And so uh, the, the ability of AUVs to cover very large swaths of area to just kind of monitor what's going on, it, it's, it's very different. The, um, the uh, uh, part of the e equation is in terms of uh, uh, what you're trying to do. Uh, uh, if you are in an underwater uh, environment and you want to find out, is there uh, uh, something there or not something there? Uh, it's a bit of a detection of something. That's, that, that's one aspect. If you are saying, well, no, I want you to go over there and tell me how the fish are feeling, uh, that's a completely different kind of measurement uh, that you have, right? Um, so uh, between security issues of uh, uh, danger detection and then finding out uh, what is uh, uh, what is the health status of a reef, uh, those require very, very different types of sensors, uh, or at least the input on it. So uh, I think it, it is a bit overblown. It kind of tends to happen. It's tribal. Uh, uh, all the technology sector is kind of uh, trying to find their own way. But uh, in the end, uh, uh, look, if there is a single purpose for submarines, and, and it's a good purpose, is to get young people, I call them, we got to get them away from the pizza industry. Like, <laughs> yeah. go make pizzas, get into, uh, today they call it STEM and all that, right? So if the only reason that they exist is to get kids excited to work on underwater machines, whatever they make, AUVs, ROVs, pilots, or whatever, it, you got them on this side, you know, and, and, and it's tricky. And it, and, and, and it is tricky because uh, you're deep in engineering, right? It is, it is a, a technical base. And uh, most of the population uh, uses the worst four letter word uh, uh, that's ever existed. And I even tell my wife, like, please uh, avoid that word. And it's a word just. Right. Okay. Because it's a strict minimizer of, of, of energy and effort, right? Well, just go and have a look. Uh, and so when you're in this business, you, you've got to kind of 
step back and figured, look, you got to do it anyway. Uh, no one will ever know just how hard you worked, how long, how many hours it is. They'll just use the word just a week later and, and, and you got to be happy with that. And that's a deep, that's a deep commitment you're making to, to, to your community to, to be able to stand with that and say, and be happy with it. Right? You're not going to be in front of, you're not going to be in front of magazines. And which you kind of find out that the guy, the people in, in, in this business keep our heads down and we just kind of do Lord's work here. Right. And I think that the different technologies have different applications and, <clears throat> and I think, you know, it's all really important. And, um, so you're chair of the, um, MTS subcommittee and you're chair of the world sub organization. Can you talk a little bit about the differences between those two? What, you know, they're two separate organizations. What, you know, what are the, What's the difference between the two organizations? Yeah, that's a, uh, a it's a recent development, and we'll talk a little bit more. I mean, it's tied clearly. Uh, uh, some of us ha- had to come out in the open uh, and, and be in front of cameras and talk about it uh, in the follow up to the Ocean Gate event, because every because that's kind of fascinated the public and not only just the public but uh, government officials as well who have no I- idea that part of our industry exists. Um, the uh, uh, so the uh, Marine Technology Society established the Manned Undersea uh, Vehicles Committee in 1968 uh, uh, as an effort to uh, before there were a lot of class regulations, rules, and stuff. Uh, the industry came up with with its own, uh, and uh, uh, MTS, the MTS group uh, uh, specialist in that, were instrumental in what we have today as. The, uh, the rules in the American Bureau of Shipping, uh, the Coast Guard rules uh, relating to submarines. Uh, and it also had, uh, in 1968, uh, some of the major players, uh, Don Walsh, Larry Shoemaker, Will Foreman, I mean, all these pioneers, uh, set up the uh, Deep Submersible Pilot Association. That was in direct response in the 1960s. Uh, everybody figured there's going to be an underwater NASA equivalent and all the big companies were building their own uh, experimental submarines. And uh, so those have kind of carried a lot of the flag over the years. Uh, the, the Marine Technology Society uh, uh, is an information uh, uh, dissemination organization. It, it helps uh, uh, tell people what's going on in the industry about the technologies. Um, the, uh, uh, and so what we finding ourselves here uh, in the last year or two is that uh, we clearly need a body that can do some advocacy for the industry and, and, and talk and bring opinions and stuff out in public to make sure we, we, we inform some of the government officials because it does make a difference what the rules are uh, or if there are no rules, if there are rules, make sure they're clear and unambiguous. Uh, and if there's something missing that we put them in there. And, uh, well, everybody realizes there are not a whole lot of submarine experts in government, so how do you get some of that sorted out? And uh, as much as a a blue-blooded Canadian, uh, 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 when I first came here in 86, uh, I I thought a lobbyist was something that's like, uh, you know, you just do that, you don't say it at night, not out in the open. And I remember the first time someone gave me a credit, a business card said it said lobbyists. Like, oh my God, I couldn't believe he kind of declared that in the opening in broad daylight. Uh, but uh, uh, sadly, here we are 30 years later. And uh, I suppose the World Submarine Organization uh, uh, is that. It's, a, it's an international organization of the industry experts to guide and, 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 and inform the government on what we really need to, to do in the next five years. Uh, and it's a type of advocacy that uh, the Marine Technology Society is not able to do. So they're kind of working in tandem. Uh, they're supporting each other. Uh, but uh, that political vehicle is is turning out to be fairly important. And it is at an international level. We had uh, here in November, we had our 20th uh, symposium. And uh, we did have a round table with the Coast Guard discussing how do we deal with some of that? And we had uh, a dozen countries with representatives saying, yeah, look, uh, we're all on board. Uh, 
it is not just a national rules we need to sort out, but some international rules of the road on how we run submarines. And uh, it is on the forefront, everybody. Uh, and that advocacy part is through the World Submarine Organization. MTS can still report the news and what's going on, but the spearhead will be through what we call WSO. It's fairly new. Um, and uh, we've rooted it in the old uh, Deep Submersible Pilot Association. I was a member for many, many years. Uh, I wanted to pursue that and continue uh, our efforts to it, but the organization decided to to close down the association. And I thought there's nothing I could do. I thought there's a lot of uh, institutional knowledge we're losing by doing that. And so with the World Submarine Organization, I'm basically reviving the old Deep Submersible Pilot Association and saying, okay, the roots, because it's a bit secular, right? It doesn't matter what type of submarine, where it is, what it does. Uh, it is a secular view of we need to care of everybody, owner, operator, designer, manufacturer, inspector uh, that pays attention to it. So that's the, the two vehicles we have at the moment. And it is about a vision forward to, to bring, to bring uh, order. So <clears throat> that brings me to a very big subject that, you know, I, we're going to talk about. Um, and that's the, um, ocean gate incident that happened last June. So I was, um, prior to that, a couple of years prior to that, I was out with Stockton on, um, his Andrea Doria expedition. I was originally part of the, um, our, as an ROV pilot and I brought a couple of ROVs and I was part of the team in case anything did go wrong. Of course, the Andrea Doria is vastly different than the Titanic. I mean, you can't even compare the depth. But um, I was able to get in and dive on the submersible. It wasn't the same one. It was the Cyclops. And it was fascinating and really cool to, to be, you know, to see that. And um, so the Ocean Gate incident it's undoubtedly had a significant impact on the submersible community. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I, I think the, uh, uh, the significant impact on the industry, uh, look, everybody in the industry uh, uh, knows what to do, what not to do. Uh, uh, if it had a significant impact, it was on... Uh, the people on the outside uh, asking the proper questions. Um, and it's, 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 it's all, always befuddled me uh, uh, personally, uh, you know, that the idea here in, in, our, in our great uh, mercantile system that how many, how many things and in industries uh, work on a buyer beware basis. Um, and, and it's a problem. Uh, it is good. It is. It is. It is. It is good for mercantilism. But uh, uh, somewhere a country has to figure out uh, the part of governance and what is the purpose of governance. Well, it is to make sure uh, you keep your people working, uh, healthy, uh, happy, and and healthy. Right. Uh, the, that, that's what you need to do for your country. So how how it relates to this? It is about the. Uh, um, uh, it is not possible, and it's a modern problem we have, and the next generation is going to have it even worse than we do. And, and with all the technology that's surrounding us and that, that we're operating on, just doing this podcast and all the video and we don't have to travel and we have airplanes and all this, um, it is increasingly and will become even more uh, difficult for a normal citizen uh, to make a decision of risk based on informed consent. I mean, there's so much stuff that's happening around us. We don't, we just take for granted that it's working, right? Right. I mean, take our cell system, right? We just, I'm like, what do you mean it's not working? I mean, I can't call my mom and stuff. Um, and it's at various levels, uh, certainly in the medical field, that, that, that is an increasing issue. And for sure, for sure, for sure, no question about it, when you're dealing with submarines, uh, I don't care how smart, how much money you have, it is impossible for you to make a decision on what risk you're taking uh, 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 on it coming out. 
just looking from the outside in. And so a lot was made about the disclaimer and the waiver and so forth. And it's like, well, this is kind of nonsense. I mean, even people ask me today, well, Will, uh, you know, what's a university uh, supposed to check? What's a checklist for a university to make sure that the submarine is safe? It's like, no, they, 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 that's, that's not the list. You need to have an education of something and, and declaring that the car is okay. Right? Uh, we take it for granted for cars. I mean, you, you're not going to weld weld your own dune buggy in the shed and go on the 405 freeway in California. I mean, right? can you physically do it? Yes. Uh, is, is it something we figure is safe and, and we should encourage? No. Um, so, uh, you know, there's a live free or die uh, approach, um, which I mean, everyone should be allowed to experiment and stuff. But there comes a point where when you're involving uh, the public and other people, you just need to be careful how you do that and, and, and how you evaluate these things. So it is a political problem uh, more than a technological. So the impact on the industry, uh, well, it's certainly brought to light to a lot of people that the small submarines exist and that there are a lot of manufacturers. So I, uh, it has not uh, reduced the amount of inquiries, let's put it that way. Um, what it has done, it has really highlighted the uh, the disconnect and the, the the loopholes we have in who is in charge of doing what. Right? And right. right now, there are a lot of discussions from all the different governments. Well, you know, how the heck did they get out there? You know, who's you know who who should have said that? There are a lot of questions being asked, and. That is nothing to do with design. It's just who, who controls it. And, and I keep, I, and I claim, I mean, I've said it before, um, you know, if you have a group that is uh, uh, willfully trying to evade every uh, safety standard and, and bypass stuff and being really clever about things, uh, and, uh, uh, and then you sneak out into international waters to do illegal activity, I think by definition and dictionary, that's called piracy. And I'll be damned if someone puts the problem of piracy at the feet of the submarine industry. Uh, we have lots of issues with piracy. Uh, and uh, Caesar had problems with piracy, so it's a 2,000-year-old problem. A um, couple of things with that. One personal pet peeve is it drives me crazy when our wonderful friends in Hollywood trying to teach our young children that piracy is something cool. Okay, it's just stupid. It's like, oh, but we can make money. Great for you, not helping the cause, right? So that that's one thing. And, and you know, it's one of the sad things about OceanGate. They did uh, engage a lot of young people, which is great. They, I mean, they put their heart and soul into it. And, you know, they're driven off a cliff, right? I mean, so... That was, but that falls uh, more into the into the side of sacrilege. Right. I know this is not popular to talk about. It's not the Catholic Church, but there is something that is sacred in the world, right? And and people's drives and ambitions and outlooks and stuff that is something sacred you can't mess with. And 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 how does that happen in this day and age? Well, it does, right? So it is. It is about Kool Aid, and 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 then it's like, how do you stop these things? Right? And I've been asked a bunch. Well, how, how do you stop it? Well, turns out that in a system like we have today, uh, you know, the well, uh, in context, uh, uh, by two thousand eighteen, I mean, we we dealt a lot with OceanGate, right? We sold them a bunch of things, and we were closely involved. Uh, I mean, we made the window. For, uh, for it. And and by the time we put it in, so okay, but you have to test it. It's not standard. Uh, 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 you got to do a bunch of testing to kind of prove it's okay. Uh, it's not a problem making it. And I said, no, we don't want to test it. Well, that's when we derated the window and said, okay, well, you can't take it deeper than uh, 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 2,000 feet, right? Which caused a problem because when the engineer refused to put it in, you got fired. Right. Right. So, the, just to say, we, we, you know, as an industry, we are very open. 
uh, we've in, we invite everybody with open arms. We are supportive. Ocean Gate joined uh, uh, the family, let's call it, uh, at the conference in 2007, 2008. Uh, everybody was eager to help them, support them. They had the, the, the antipodes. They brought in the, the, the Lula. They turned into Cyclops, and then they kind of made Cyclops 2. And it was a bit weird that, you know, they dressed Cyclops 1 and Cyclops 2 the same, and then people had a hard time telling the difference. One was classed, one wasn't, right? So there's a bit of game playing over there where, I mean, if you don't know, if you're not an expert, you can't tell the difference between the two, but you could say that Cyclops is classed. Yeah, well, which one? One or two? So silly little games being played. And uh, and it became more and more evident that, you know, they're, they're, they're not playing by the same rules. And Stockton was pretty open about it. It's like, well, you know, I don't give a darn. Uh, you guys don't get it. And so, so what do you do? And it's, it's back to uh, uh, what can we do? And what is the, what is the regulatory affairs? Uh, in 2018, after our, our, our conference, a lot of people had serious concerns. And it's like, oh, what the heck do we do? I mean, we need to sue them. They, they, this, is going to, this is going to end badly. And it's like, well, we can't just have one manufacturer sue another manufacturer. I mean, it just doesn't work. Like, what are the options? And it's like, well, I'll tell you what, why don't we just, why don't we just do it professionally and gather a, a, a letter from world experts around the globe, which gather every year uh, and say, hey, uh, maybe we can do a personal letter, a, a personal letter to the CEO, to Stockton. I call it the Dear Stockton letter, right? It's like, okay, look, Stockton. I mean, we get it, uh, but I mean, look, you need to be careful and you need to have a third party look at this stuff, or at least you need to do a proper test plan to test this properly. I mean, one dive to 4,000 meters is not a test plan. And, um, but it was to not, right? It, it, it was, it, it was to not. Uh, there are a bunch of other bits that happened, but in the end, what turns out is the only, the, the last domino to fall uh, is uh, the port captain, right? And it's like, oh, well, what's the port captain supposed to do? Well, what we have today uh, as, as tools uh, uh, with defamation and all sorts of liabilities you kind of have, the one group you can't sue is a Coast Guard. Right. Right. So basically, that's really the last domino over here, and the Coast Guard needs to kind of adjudicate and say, yeah, that's experimental, that's fine, but you're not taking these people. Or uh, it's like, well, what do you do in international waters? Well, that's back to the piracy. How do you, you control it? I don't know, but tell you what, why don't we start with, uh, uh, if you're going into international waters with this rig over here, it's like, not from my port, right? And if we have that where most first and second world countries say, no, these, this is to you can only get to international waters through a national water, you're not going out of here. And if you have to do an expedition uh, leaving from Murmansk somewhere uh, uh, or Pyongyang somewhere, it's like, okay, it's going to cost you a bunch of money. Good luck. Right? It, it's, a, it's a pragmatic approach to it. So it does come down to be unambiguous and also consistent on how you verify something going out. And, and some of the stuff that were there right now, there's a, a lot of discussion in Canada. It's like, how do we let this sort of happen? And everyone's throwing up their hands like, well, I don't know. I didn't know what to do. Um, and I mean, you know, at some level, it's like, really, really? When you're going to tow a little kind of platform for 400 nautical miles into the North Atlantic? Right. Come on, the, the German Navy uh, uh, wasn't afraid of doing risky stuff with their U-boats in World War II, but they didn't do stu- stuff like that. As the blue economy grows globally, Marine Technology Reporter has the world's largest audited subsea audience. MTR offers insights and analysis from researchers, innovators, and thought leaders in ocean subsea commerce, defense, and academia. At MTR, we always stay one step ahead. For more information on how you can stay on the cutting edge, go to www.marinetechnologynews.com. So could you talk a little bit about, you talked about classed and Mm -hmm. um, it not being classed. Could you talk a little bit about um, what kind of safety protocols are typically 
typically in place um, for these crude submersibles or subs and, um, you know, what being classed means and, you know, yeah. why that's important. Well, look, everybody, uh, uh, yeah. I mean, everybody will uh, readily nod and say, yeah, you know, we need to learn from past experiences. Right. And no one will deny that. And it's a good thing. It's a healthy thing. And that's how humans kind of uh, move forward. And uh, I still think it's absolutely fantastic that as puny humans, like Futurama would say, you know, you're puny human. I mean, how dare you uh, 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 stand in front of forces that are a million times bigger than you? What's well, you either crazy or at least very ballsy, you know? Right. And and but the magic is we can. You just got to be careful, right? And so the the lessons learned over the past fifty years, uh, there's been a bunch of them, and in fact we've had a mechanism of capturing these lessons learned, and and that all goes into a book of rules of things you should be paying attention to and things you need to do, uh, and. These rule books uh, uh, are uh, are compiled by uh, companies called uh, classification agencies. Uh, most countries have a, a national agency. In the U.S., it's the American Bureau of Shipping. Uh, in Europe, it's uh, Det Nordske Veritas, Bureau Veritas in France, RENA in Italy, uh, Lloyd's in the U.K. and and they have their own book and their 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 own rules uh, specifically for submarines. For, for building those. And they're reviewed every year. Uh, they're looking at stuff that, I mean, there's always new things that come in. And basically what you do is you do the design. And the purpose of it is when a, 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 a client who knows nothing about submarines uh, 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 wants to buy one, uh, what are you going to tell them? Oh, yeah, I built it real good. It's like, okay, how do I get that insured? So they usually represent the client to make sure that their inspectors and their engineers verify your plans and your test procedures and the test data you do to make sure that, yep, you've actually built it the way you should. Uh, so it is a safety for, uh, for, the, for the client. The same thing happens for an oil rig. An oil company is not going to know if we made the oil rig properly. So the class uh, or, or a big uh, container ship I mean, the class societies will go and verify and check everything and tell the client, yep, this has been built to code and uh, it is kosher. There's an argue saying, well, you know, we want to go, uh, we want to do something brand new and the code uh, doesn't address these things. So we're just going to go on our own. Um, the, then you're, you're on the borderline and say, how do you deal with that? Um, that's why class societies meet every year, uh, look at things, and in a lot of cases in their book say uh, these are the rules unless a uh, something separate is proposed and we will evaluate it. Uh, right. It does take time and it does some cost some money uh, to do that, but uh, we have... Uh, uh, there are statistics here, uh, you know, people say, oh yeah, back to the 70s, that was a heyday of submarines. Um, I did a paper in 2006, 2007, and I compiled, well, how many dives did the world do? Uh, so I had to run the master library of active submarines, and they're doing somewhere between two and 4,000 dives worldwide per year uh, in the 70s. And today, it's more like uh, thirty or 40,000 dives per day, uh, per right. year. Right, right. Uh, and isn't it in, in the years, 70s... The, but like between 70 and 74, there were five fatalities, and that was before the class system was put into place. And then following that, that 1974, after, after 1974, after that class process was put into place, this is the first, there were no fa fa fatalities until the Ocean Gate expedition. I mean, we, yeah, no, and we, that wasn't we, we, classed. No, well, a bunch of things kind of came in, right? So in the 70s, uh, it, it did push uh, 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 much more uh, detailed uh, uh, class rules from different people. And we have hadn't had any fatalities since the mid-70s, like zero. And and we've all been conscious of it. It's like, okay, can you maintain zero forever? Uh, you can't scale zero, right? Uh, 
I've looked at the NTSB uh, uh, fatalities report of all different modes of transport. I mean, there's like two dozen of them. Submarines not on there. But, you know, uh, when you're having uh, uh, jet skis with 100,000 fatalities a year, uh, uh, helicopters uh, have two dozen or so. Uh, zero is zero, right? And so it puts you in the position of, boy, uh, uh, you know, what happens when, when, when there is a fatality? I mean, in our wildest dream, we wouldn't have thought that in a single event you would double the amount of fatalities ever in our industry. Right? Um, so, but the, 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 the important thing is to, to accept and realize just how much these vehicles are being used on a daily basis. Uh, uh, it is not like the, the off chance that something goes underwater and that we know how to build them and we know how to operate them safely. Uh, no question. Um, and so now it's just about making sure that like, even with a perfectly safe car, uh, you can drive off a cliff and do something stupid. Right. Right. So could, could you talk a little bit about, um, based on the information that we have, obviously, and talking a little bit about the design and construction of the Ocean Gate sub, um, could you walk a little bit through what you think happened and why, um, you know, why that ended up happening? Well, you know, not completely crazy about people speculating uh, uh, over the last six months and uh, 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 about what it is, but, but I'll tell you a couple of things. Um, the uh, it is it is it is about intent and motive and and approach right right um, we are we are in a small i call it family we're we're a group of experts in this field and 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 everybody aims to aims for a valhalla here but uh, you know there there are some said and unsaid rules here one of it is the respect for physics, right? Uh, and that is here uh, on uh, what direction uh, Stockton was taking. Um, so I'm going back a little bit here because it has come up. The the assembly and the verification of the design, I mean, he had the chief engineer, I mean, David Lockridge uh, 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 is prominent in, in that whole affair. And, and that was really bad. Uh, uh, something broke on that one and and someone asked me uh, a couple of weeks ago about it and and i struggled to find the word but i did find it i did find the word and i said you know that event was a sacrilege that i i i, uh, I was going to use some other term but i had to google uh, uh, this is thesaurus like okay what's the word i'm like, and, and it was a sacrilege it is just stuff you don't do Right. And it's like, okay, if you're going to go there, you are all of a sudden breaking all the sacred rules of the trust you have in the engineers and having to kind of do that. Um, and, and he really broke that. And that was, that was a really, really bad sign. And, and that was around uh, 2018 after we wrote the letter. And that is like, okay, all uh, lights go to red over here. Uh, we have a rogue element playing over here. And this is, this is dangerous. Right. Um, so to the extent of what happens, um, I'll tell you one of the first things when I heard on Monday uh, uh, that, oh my gosh, they, they, they've kind of lost contact. I started counting back and it's like, well, I wonder how long they've been in there uh, uh, or how long they've, they've missed for uh, communication. And then I find out, oh no, they, they launched on Sunday. And it's like, holy moly, what do you mean you launch on Sunday? Um, the the what I want to say is the first thing that occurred as like what are the options and so forth is the fact that nothing was ever verified by a third party or anything right. means nobody knew what was on the vehicle. Right. So even if you tried, I mean, you could have put me there. So like, okay, what do we do? It's like I don't know. I don't know what they put in there. There is no record. And and I thought. Huh. That, that never occurred to me that the fact that you have a third-party review allowed for 
so in, in worst case event where nobody knows anything, that you have a source of saying, okay, well, our, our best uh, analysis is this is what's on board and, and these are the options they have. In this case, it was just zero. Um, a lot of that was very clever, but it was not wise, right? Uh, and so the other part, the, well, for sure, something that didn't help. Uh, there's a lot of talk about the uh, carbon fiber hull, uh, uh, and and that was just very silly. Uh, you know, the, the idea of having a patent that detects uh, uh, that detects what happens in the hull, right? It's it's like putting a detector on the grenade that'll give you a second warning. Well, by the time that goes off, you're dead. Right, so it, right. It's 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 just nonsense. But it's back of the Kool Aid. You managed to sell it to some people that didn't know any better. It's like, well, why didn't they know any better or check anything? I have been and keep being vocal about the fact that people that are in a high position, in high authority, that like to have capes and hats and big salaries and nice and comfort and have big titles and stuff. Well, it comes at a cost. And it's like, it's a, 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 you got to do your job and you got to pay attention. And you don't get all that social adoration and edification if, you, if you're not checking the information. And if you're at a university, uh, you must know how valuable information is. It isn't just casual, right? So that's a problem. And maybe it's a bit of lethargy over there. Okay, if someone needs to wake up, you better wake up because this is not a good thing. And you're going to get called out. So, I mean, that's why we have our organizations. I mean, look, we don't charge for anything. And when people don't call, it's like, well, you don't advertise enough. It's like, okay. Look, we are out there. We, we've been at it long enough. Somebody can call and find out and kind of find out the information. So that is a, 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 a big no-no that happened on OceanGate. And then it's like, well, uh, the biggest sin that they did and say, well, it's money, it's time and all that. It's like, okay, well, I'll tell you what. You know, the biggest sin is the 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 fact that they went on to this expedition. I mean, you've been on the Andrea Doria. The... Uh, that they went out there and it's just standard procedure in the industry for one, you have a class submersible, so somebody's verified that you built it properly. But then for operations, you have to have an operating plan, right? right. So you have to, before you go out, you, you have to have, okay, what is the equipment? You either have on board a rescue vehicle, yep. on, uh, like another submarine or an ROV, something that's able to access it, or you have to have someone on call to make sure if I pick up the phone, look, you need to show up, right, and not start thinking about it. Uh, and that type of organization, that emergency response plan, that's not money and time. That's just attention. And not doing that is just a failure at the most profound level. Right. right. And and that, and then never mind the fact that they they got authorization to go over, probably because the ship was a First Nations boat. Mm -hmm. So I suspect the First Nations boat, just my personal opinion here, had some influence on some federal regulations you could bypass in Canadian waters. And two, uh, they didn't put the submarine on the boat, so they couldn't say, well, your boat has a submarine on board here. They were, because, oh, well, I just got a rope dangling the back of my boat. Oh, really? It's like, didn't anybody ask, well, what's behind that rope? It's like, oh, we got a platform. Okay, very good. I mean, it's like it is... You know, I, I compare it to towing a baby carriage from L.A. to San Francisco behind a Toyota Corolla. Can you do it? Yes. Is it sensible? I mean, no. I mean, right. uh, like, why are you even allowed to go on the road, right? It, 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 it's so nonsensical. But the to go out there uh, uh, without any emergency response plan in place and, 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 and being at the dock saying, it's like, I want to go explore the Arctic and you show up in a pair of Speedos. It's like, seriously? It's like, no, right. go home, get yourself a car, right. you know? Right. I mean, the the level of of, of, of failure to, to have any sort of common sense verification of not letting go is, is, is astounding. The uh, To the extent what happened to it, uh, uh, look, towing, towing a vehicle like that, the LRT they have, which is... A pretty tricky vehicle uh, uh, to start with. Um, I mean, ask uh, Terry Kirby at the University of Hawaii. I mean, he's used the LRTs with the Pisces 4 and 5 for many, many years. Uh, it's a clever design, but you got to be really careful with those. Um, 
uh, and it's mostly meant for coastal waters, not going out in the open ocean. But the uh, the amount of uh, like the North Atlantic can get rough. Uh, the amount of uh, 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 shock you're going to get, uh, a, a vibration wave slap on a platform like this, uh, and you do that for 400 nautical miles. Uh, the state of the submarine as an assembly, verified assembly, is not going to be the same when you arrive at destination than when you left port. Exactly. So, right. And so, uh, uh, what are the 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 what are the uh, contributing factors? Well, there's any number of them. Uh, I mean, what's fairly clear is somewhere the hull gave way. I think they picked up the titanium end bells. I mean, they made out titanium. So something happened, uh, and and it's something that uh, I do with kids uh, to show them just. Uh, uh, how strong and how delicate uh, uh, cylinders can be. Uh, you can try it out. I mean, if you have a bunch of first graders, tell them about pressure. Uh, take an empty Coke can and just stand the Coke can on the ground, uh, put a board on it, and put a kid on, on, on it. It'll support the weight of a kid. I mean, you could even stand on it. Mm-hmm. I mean, as long as it, not a full can, but an empty can, right? It weighs nothing. Uh, but then if you go and you just take a, a, a pencil and you just poke the side a little bit so that you make a little dent in it, they'll just fall immediately. Right, right. And, it, and that's just the basic demonstration of buckling, right? Uh, cylinders are extremely strong as if the pressure is balanced. If you have any sort of deflection, and that's why most submarines, people go nuts about measuring the circularity of the hull, just how round it is. Um, any sort of, of dent in it can kind of cause a, 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 a place where you, you, you initiate buckling. So the, there's any number of things that can do that, but that's how cylindrical pressure vessels, for the space they have and the efficiency, that is a cost. You've got to be really, really careful at, 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 its, at its buckling danger. I've worked, I've done a lot of work in the North Atlantic and it is uh, all times of the year in all sorts of different um, types of projects. And uh, it's, it's not, it's not a very forgiving environment and that's a long way to tow a system and, you know, not think that there could be some sort of something that could, you know, impair the hull of the the vessel um, moving around in, in that shop and getting towed all that distance. Yeah, definitely. Uh, it's the North Atlantic is very unforgiving. I mean, you can get lucky, right? But uh, 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 like they say, hope is not a strategy, right? It's just right. Not a good idea, right? right. So uh, the, the speculation on it, the, the fact that they, they certainly did not, uh, 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 do a fair trade analysis and check. Um, the classification wise, uh, for the record, uh, the American Bureau of Shipping said, look, we don't know about carbon fiber and we know bid. Uh, uh, Lloyd's registry uh, uh, went into the Bahamas to look at it. Uh, they had some experience with non metallic pressure holes. Um, and they looked at it, and after the dive, uh, they said, "Yeah, no, I, I, we're, we're, we're not interested." Um, to which uh, 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 Ocean Gate then uh, posted all over the place that uh, uh, Lloyd's Registry verified uh, uh, the hull by a test dive, and that's like well, that, that's kind of embellishing it just slightly, uh, and then uh, DNV. GL, based out of uh, Hamburg in Germany, did have a look, and uh, Harold Pauli was a department head, and I talked with Harold, and he says, yeah, you know, uh, I, I, I went out on a limb here, and we spent two, three months figuring out, coming up with a plan on how we could class this thing, and, and we spent a lot of time to come up with a proposal, which by the time he sent it to OceanGate, it was rejected out of hand, and uh, needless to say, Harold was a uh, uh, pretty miffed that uh, all his his efforts were just so casually thrown in the garbage. Um, so the the 
I am sure it was expensive uh, uh, and it took some time, uh, but they had an option. They, 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 they cannot say they did not have the option. So that's a matter of record. I presented a paper at the conference in November saying, okay, a carbon fiber hull, how are you supposed to test it? Right. And right. We, we are here at Hydrospace Group. We do pressure vessels for human occupancy. So that covers uh, space stations, it covers medical, hyperbaric, medical chambers, Navy diving systems, submarines, habitats. I mean, we're experts in pressure vessels for human occupancy. And I say, hey, we have a code in the book that's been there for 40 years on how you test a pressure vessel for human occupancy that is non-standard, using non-standard material, i.e. not metallic, right? And it basically means you have to blow up five units you got to put one under uh, 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 five times maximum pressure for 300 hours, and then you got to put a thousand cycles on it. Okay, that's more than one or two dives to 4,000 meters. Right. right. It's like, well, that's kind of overkill. Yeah, but that is what has guided us for the last 40 years. It's in the book. If you want to come with something else, come up with something else. But you can't just do nothing or say there is nothing available for us to hang our hat on. And... The pressure vessel, it's under ASME, ASME, PVHO. Uh, it is federal law. Anything that's more than two PSI is subject to the ASME code. And it's regulated state by state, but Washington state is a PVHO state. So even if they didn't go for a class, it was their duty to go and have it uh, checked by ASME for a pressure vessel. So the whatever all the means, uh, uh, all is fair in love and war, whatever means they use to bypass all that uh, come out in some investigation. But uh, we have these things in place. It's not true that it isn't. So the fact that they had that pressure vessel, it was not appropriately tested. And the reason you blow up five of them and you do a bunch of tests is the statistical distribution. If you make one, I mean, you're going to make the second one the same. Right. Right. I mean, it's a big deal. So uh, the only good thing about all this, if there is a good thing, is that, uh, uh, I mean, my wife was horrified because she still knows how this stuff works, that, you know, for a time they thought they were going to be down there in the dark. And right. uh, that was a, I, I avoided thinking about that uh, because that's a, what people forget is everyone was counting the oxygen, and it's not so much the oxygen uh, uh, that'll kill you. The carbon dioxide will kill you much sooner, and that's a matter of how much power you have in your batteries. Because when your motor fan stops for the for the scrubber, your history pretty quick. Then you get in this uncomfortable situation of saying, okay, do I put some of that battery power in heat so that we don't die from hyperthermia, or do we put it on a scrubber? It's just not a nice, nice place to kind of go. The fact that it was instantaneous uh, was probably God had mercy on our souls here as humans. Right. Well, and, you know, another thing when you were talking about the passenger vessel, um, <clears throat> you know, there's a reason that they've been designed in a spherical design as opposed to a tube like that because of the pressure being equal well, it is about, well, it's equal. It's just a sensitivity, right? A sphere, you're not going to have a buckling issue with a sphere. Right, exactly. Right. And so, yeah, it was very ambitious to, to increase the volume. I mean, volume underwater is a luxury. I mean, space, mm -hmm. right? It's really a luxury. And to make a large uh, five a volume for five people is really, really tough. A cylinder is effective at it, but it just goes from, you know, a scale of one to two to a scale of nine, ten in terms of engineering difficulty of making sure you keep that cylinder straight. Right, right. So what kind of um, steps in the aftermath of this, what, what steps are being taken in the industry, and you're at the forefront of that, to prevent similar, similar incidents in the future? Yeah, that, that is the big question. Right. So, <clears throat> I mean, there's a lot of question what happened, but it's a bit moot at this point. Uh, we, we, we know how to design these things. We, we go down there all the time. Uh, 
but it is about uh, uh, operational rules of the road. And uh, I, I, have, I, I have been uh, preaching in the desert for a few years now uh, at the U.S. Coast Guard that we need to do something. There, is, uh, there are rules uh, uh, for operating submersibles, manned submersibles at the U.S. Coast Guard. Uh, they're mostly geared towards uh, large tourist submarines, like the 40, 50 passenger submarines they have in Hawaii. Uh, but the, uh, uh, it, it, fails, it fails to address uh, a, a whole lot of change. And uh, these rules were uh, enacted in 1993. Uh, that's when all the tourist submarines were showing up. And uh, I mean, today that is uh, maybe less than 2% of the submarine population. We're missing the uh, 95 or 98 percent of all the other vehicles uh, that that have smaller number of people and are going a lot deeper than right now. The Coast Guard rules limit to 150 feet uh, to you know depth of 150 feet, and you have to have a diver next to you. So you know we've had smaller submersibles rated for a thousand feet to take people down. Say, well, you have to have a diver in place to get the Coast Guard certification. Like, well, we're not going to send a diver down to. Like, how about an ROV? No, it says in the rules it has to be a diver. It's like, okay, don't you think that's like way, way, it's not appropriate. There's a bunch of other bits. The, what we need, and it's not just, so what's the next step? It's not just in the U.S. because these submarines travel around the world. People show up with their boat in the submarine. And what we need to do is the, and we need to find some international baseline on rules of what we all agree to. So there's two right. points, but I'll start with that one. The first one is, uh, I use an analogy of a dirt road, uh, just in my farmer mind, right? So if you have a little dirt road and you have one tractor, one bicycle, and one car a day that travels on it, you don't have a traffic problem on that road. Uh, by the time you have more traffic and you're in Los Angeles somewhere, well, somewhere there was a human invention that said, look, why don't we all agree that we take that road and we draw a line in the center? And you guys drive that direction on that side of the line, and you guys drive in the other direction, the other side of the line. You say, well, that's really stupid and simple. It's like, yeah, but it made a huge difference in the safety of traffic and regulating the stuff. And it is something that was easily adopted in every country, that you draw a line in the middle, and you have two different lanes, and, you, and that's how you control that. Um, I'm thinking we need to aim for something similar of just defining what the lanes are. Uh, because you have to differentiate the stuff. So it's, it's a bit more complicated, but we have essentially, um, the, the idea here is uh, the Coast Guard in 1993 has defi defined uh, four categories of sub uh, little submarines. The first one was a personal submarine you can make it for yourself. You can go in Lake Michigan and just dive whatever you want. So those are just uncertified private vehicles. And and that works. That stays. Uh, that's one category. The other one was a, a small submersible with uh, six people or less. Uh, then the next one was a, a, a large tourist submarines, that more than six people, that are less than 150 tons as a displacement. That's subchapter T. And then subchapter H was uh, uh, large submarines greater than 150 tons, of which it, there isn't anything. But they came up with these four categories. And, well, the experimental stuff, you don't have to do anything. I mean, it just, you know, you just can't do any business. You can take friends and family, and that's about it. Um, the small, the, the uh, six-passenger submersible or less and the large tourist submersible were all combined in one. And the, there was a congressional uh, resolution put together that was lobbied by the Passenger Vessel Association. I am not clear why they did that. And they said, if you have one paying passenger, uh, you have to be uh, fully Coast Guard certified at the same level as the ferry with a thousand people. I mean, it's, it's, it, it's pretty involved. And, and that's what's the world today. Um, what we need to do, is, and and that's saying, well, more is better. And it's like, yeah, but you do not have the resources at the moment. You can't, you can't take a small, uh, two-person 
electric boat and apply all the rules of a thousand passenger ferry to it. Is it safe? Yes, but you can't afford it resource wise. Right. So what we need to do is somehow figure out, look, why don't we just establish around the world that the guy at the port who directs all that, he's not a lawyer. He's got two minutes to make a decision. Right? And the six passenger or less type of vehicle represents about 95% of all modern production today. And it's not addressed. It's a problem. Right? So uh, what can we do? Well, just make sure that every country figures, okay, you're a type one, two, three, or four, right? What are you? I'm a type two. I've got four passengers. I'm, I'm classed and certified. It's like, okay, you have an operations plan. Yeah, here it is. Okay, boat certified. You're good to go. Uh, there is no longer any discussion of legal definition of what a passenger is, like whoever is in there. If you have more than six, uh, then you are back to the the ferry verification. You've got lots of uh, public people. You got to pay attention, and you do what what we have now. Um, all coast guards around the world have the same problem: is they're fighting for budget, they're limited in resources, and what we're saying here is, hey, we're going to create a whole new transport sector that you need to worry about, that you ignored for the last fifty years because it just wasn't worth bothering about it. But it's like. Well, I've got news for you. You're doing it right now. It is possible to do so, but it needs to be done efficiently. Efficiently at the level of resources and so that the port captain has an easy decision to make. It's like, show me your papers. You know, right. you want to go out, uh, you want to go out to, 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 to the reef. Okay, where are your papers? Here you go. Here's my registration. I'm certified. I'm in class. My papers are in order. How many people you have? Four. Okay, vamanos. Just keep us posted where you are. So it's kind of the two-minute test. If ports do that the same, we kind of have a baseline. And and if you have larger submarines, yeah, now you get into public transport. Coast Guards are their own organization. They they are proud. They want to do everything themselves. And as an industry, we're saying, look, let, let some of the class societies that do this for a living verify the design. If you come with a class certificate, uh, it has validity at the Coast Guard. And you say, okay, you have a class certificate. This is good. You know what? We like to make sure we check this and this also. It's like, well, you're welcome to check it. And then the, the vehicle gets registered with a Coast Guard under class. And it's a good excuse for the owner to maintain class. Right? But there is a very effective way of doing that. And, I mean, it, it's reasonably straightforward. The issue is to try and bring that across multiple nations and jurisdiction so everybody evaluates the lane in the same in, in the same way and i think if we get that done in the next five years ten years that will that will undergird the development for the next 25 years but we need to bring some order to it and within the industry you know we all have our gray hair we've been at it 30 years I keep saying, look, we don't need to make another submarine to the Mariana Trench to prove we can do this stuff. Right now, what we need to do is lay the foundation for the next generation for it to grow as a... It's a part of governance. You can decide to do like some countries in Japan. Uh, you can't have a private submarine. So it was just, you know, the zero solution is a solution also. But then you forego economic development. Do you want to do that or not? Well, that becomes a governance issue, what you want to do with your country. Right. And that's, I was going to ask you about that because there's, you know, international um, impact with this, right? So that's what you guys are doing at the World Sub Organization is trying to, because uh, that was going to be one of my questions was, okay, well, if you come up with these standards, and there's already standards that exist, it's just that this incident that happened last year, those, it, it, those standards were not adhered to, they were ignored. But um when you do come up with these more, uh, you know, astringent type standards that everybody has to follow to be able to move forward, um, you know, how does that go international and how is that, you know, does every country follow it and how does that work? Well, look, the, the, it, it is an international question. And that's why we, we, we need to be conscious right away from the beginning. 
And the way you do that is through IMO, right? Right. Right. But but you don't start at IMO because IMO doesn't really have any sort of teeth, right? Uh, IMO, uh, if we can get uh, 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 20, 30 countries kind of following the same template and adjudicating the, the operation the same way, then you can enshrine it in IMO. Right. right. And so the... Look, it's a it's a short career move for anybody in the government uh, uh, to come up with submarine rules, because <laughs> whatever you write, someone's going to bitch about it. Right. So, I mean, that's part of the World Submarine Organization. Say, look, we're a body of experts over here. Uh, our 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 essence here is to see the safe growth uh, 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 and development of the industry in an orderly, safe fashion for the public. And we have the expertise to come up with a template. And and if we can come up with a template and say, look, uh, we'll give you a hint. It's called copy and paste on Word, right? right. Uh, put it in your book. Uh, you can color in the margins uh, and add a few things that you like. Uh, but the that the that the core of 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 these things are common everywhere. If we can accomplish that, then it's easy. To then go at IMO and say, okay, look, uh, most countries already do that. Why don't we enshrine that uh, as an international standard? Right. So with the technology itself, where do you see the next big breakthroughs in in this um, in this area with, with subs? Where do you see the next major breakthroughs? Uh, they have to be in uh, power and communication, mm -hmm. right? Uh, what people forget uh, is that when you're underwater, we're so used to our phone tracking, telling us where to turn left at a signal light and all that, the GPS and all that. Uh, you are basically uh, 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 at zero once you cross the waterline, right? You, right. And, and you can throw billions at it, you still won't know where you are. So navigation underwater, we do not have a satellite GPS system underwater. It's a, it's a very, very big deal. Um, and there, there are a couple of things you can do with uh, uh, communication systems, uh, but sending any type of message or signal underwater, uh, our uh, uh, radio frequencies just don't work. Acoustic works, there's some laser capability, there's something they, 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 if we break that nut of being a, have a some long range communication, let's say 10, 20 kilometers. I mean, that would be nice, right? Um, yeah. That, that would be a game changer. And the other one is clearly like over here, it's an electric vehicle uh, power. Uh, lithium is making a, a big difference. I mean, but they're expensive, right? I mean, we, the, the first submarines we built uh, 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 25 years ago, I mean, they'd run all day, uh, uh, and the battery system probably cost uh, uh, $10,000, $15,000. The lithium uh, uh, pack today, which is much, much smaller, is like $200,000. Well, that's a big difference, right? Right. Um, and, I mean, depends depends where you go. The So I, I wouldn't quite... Dis uh, 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 discount uh, the simpler battery technology because if you're just working near shore and you're just counting stuff call it the uh, the underwater john deere here um, <laughs> i mean it's it's robust it's simple and and it keeps running um, the uh, after after 30 years of doing this uh I have my secret project going of making the uh, what I call the thousand dollar submarine. Oh, nice! I'll order one. <laughs> yeah, well, I, so you and I can have one. You know, I mean, shoemaker has no shoes, right? I mean, we can't afford our own uh, five million dollar submarine, but we can own one of these. So, the uh, that'll be a next story uh, because we're going to have an, another talk. But the idea there is if you can get uh, 100,000 of these out in the water every day uh, and people crossing the Narnia barrier, mm -hmm. uh, if 
I were a professor and, and, and kids wanted to do a, a marine a biology master's, it's like, okay, you got to get your butt in the water every day for two years. Right. Right. That'd be great. Kids would love that. They would. Nothing like being there. It is nothing like being in there. And it's just like farming, right? I mean, you got to go out in the back field and see what the heck is going on, right? Why are the cows getting sick? Well, they're eating this stuff. It's like, okay. So there, it is not pleasant, but it is something you're doing for your country. Uh, and it is important. And if you say, okay, uh, these two kilometers of shoreline down to whatever depth, uh, that's your area. You're going to dive it and you're going to drive the submarine in there every day. And you're going to look. You, you've seen the movie uh, 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 Octopus, my teacher? Mm-hmm. Yep. All right. Do that 100,000 times. <laughs> right? Right. Okay. What's going to happen is all these kids and all these students are going to have amazing stories that they're going to tell their friends and their mom and their grandma. And their moms and grandma are going to be so proud of the things they're finding out. It's like, oh, little octopus Jimmy. I was like, you wouldn't believe what they did. And if you do that well over 10 years, you're going to find out that all these stories, the word of mouth, the six degrees of separation, is going to float through your community. And people will start having a connection to the ocean because they're proud of little Jimmy. Right. And that's how you create political uh, uh, support for management of the ocean because people will connect to it. But it does mean that young people have to freeze their butt off and be in the water. It's like, hey, instead of a two-year stint in the army, do this. Exactly. Do good for your country. So, you see, there's a limitless amount of stuff where we should wake up every morning. I told my son, I said, Henrik, <clears throat> says, do you think in 100 years people will still have ideas to patent? Because we're talking at lunch yesterday at some of my workers here were eating. And it's, oh, you know, I think everything's been invented. And it's like, you know, in 1892, uh, Congress passed a bill that failed. They were going to close the patent office because they're running. It's like, oh, everything's been invented already. 1892, they're going to close the patent office. <laughs> it's a fact. You could check it out, right? So I told Henry, hey, do you think in 100 years ago, uh, people still have ideas you can patent? He thought about it for a couple of minutes and said, mm, yeah, I think so. It's like, oh, my God, just imagine if there's still things to be patented back there, there Ideas are like butterflies. They're all around you. You just got to catch them, right? I was like, well, then the density of unclaimed ideas must be higher today. <laughs> right? Right. Yeah. Wow. I mean, oh, my God. Just catch them. So that's the, that's, that's the, that's the message to, to, to the young people. Think, think, think. That's why we send you to school. Think and be imaginative. Use your imagination. Come up with stuff. The world needs it. That's true. Well, Will, this has been... A fascinating conversation. I want to thank you so much for taking the time to be on Deep Dive. And um, again, I'm, I just find the topic of, uh, you know, submersibles in general, just amazingly interesting. And um, the technology, I think, is just, it's always just fascinated me ever since I was a kid. So, I, you know, I want to thank you for being on Deep Dive and uh, taking the time to uh, talk to us today. Well, it's been totally my pleasure, and uh, there's so many things to talk about, but you know what Spock would say about all this, right? What's that? Fascinating. <laughs> oh, thanks, Will. Thanks so much. All right. Thank you. This episode of Deep Dive was brought to you by the publishers of Marine Technology Reporter, Interested in being a guest or a sponsor for Deep Dive? For more information about this podcast and many other opportunities for your company to stay informed and in the know, go to marinetechnologynews.com. And as usual, hit like and subscribe anywhere you get your podcast. See you again on the next Deep Dive.